On April 13th of 1769, the HMS Endeavor landed on the Pacific Island of Tahiti. Its captain, one Lieutenant James Cook, had been ordered by the Royal Navy to undertake a scientific mission of discovery to make an astronomical observation first suggested by another nautical man some 100 years earlier. The observation, one of many to be performed on August 3rd, would be made by Cook along with the expedition scientists Joseph Banks and Charles Green. The goal was to measure the exact time of the beginning and end of the transit of Venus across the face of the Sun at the same time others at different latitudes were doing the same thing. By looking at the differences of transit time for each different latitude, it was thought that the size of the solar system could be measured to within one-fifth of the diameter of the Sun. Cook, who had made his name as a brilliant navigator and as more than a passable scientist by mapping the coast of Newfoundland and observing an annular eclipse of the sun while doing so, made preparations by building a stable observing platform at the northern end of Montave Bay at the location dubbed Fort Venus. Inside the palisaded encampment, an observatory was constructed to make the necessary observations in the best possible conditions. While the data itself turned out to be disappointing to a degree due to the effect of Venus's atmosphere, something hinted at by earlier observations of the 1761 transit of Venus, it was still good enough to work out the size of the orbit of the Earth. In 1771, the overall project's principal investigator, the civilian chair of astronomy, Thomas Hornsby, was able to come up with a number of 93,726,900 English miles, a figure less than 1% from the modern value obtained using radar generated with the world's largest radio telescopes. For his part, Cook would complete a circumnavigation of the globe after time spent mapping the coastline of New Zealand and becoming the first European to land on the eastern and northern coasts of the continent of Australia. And he would continue to play an important role in the scientific expeditions of the late 17th century until his death on his third great voyage. The idea for the measurement, the first to truly pin down the size of not just the Earth's orbit, but all the known solar system, had originated in a 1691 paper published on the basis of work done on another small island this time in the Atlantic, by a man that might rightly be called the first modern scientist, one Edmund Halley. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 27.6, Supplemental. Edmund Halley, Always in Motion. If we are to accept John Maynard Keynes' assertion that Isaac Newton was the last magician, the final intellect born of a worldview governed by occult and mysterious forces, we are naturally led to wonder who the first scientist was. Who was the first person who embraced the full set of tools bequeathed to the West by the scientific revolution? While I certainly think that it is possible for a person to predate Newton, as an overlap of generational worldviews is certainly possible, I don't think we want to look any earlier than those individuals who really begin to think about what it means to do natural philosophies in ways that are primarily empirical and mathematical. I also believe that for this new title of scientist to apply, one needs to understand both the role of establishing natural law and the practice of hypothetical thinking and testing. There has to be more than just gathering data, 
but also the sense that that data is being gathered for the purpose of establishing the validity of a view of how a natural system behaves. For some, the figure that gets pointed to is Robert Boyle, and his skeptical chemist certainly has many of these elements. However, I might argue that like Newton, his unwillingness to accept the reality that alchemy neither made progress on the problems it purported to solve, nor, in its community of practice, allowed a full and open scrutiny, even after James II decriminalized its practice, that's all a strike against that claim that Boyle would be the first scientist. Another person certainly might be Giovanni Domenico Cassini, who was absolutely the first person to undertake telescopic observation on a scientific basis with a focus on rigorous observation and data gathering that led to the first understanding that the structure observed around Saturn by Galileo was in fact a ring. Though it should be noted, he did not truly grasp its nature. That would be something that would have to wait some 200 or so years until the work of James Clerk Maxwell. Here again, while Cassini was an observationalist par excellence, I've not come across any sources that suggest that he was making the observations as a part of an effort to resolve questions of a hy hypothetical sort. However, perhaps he could be thought of as the person we seek. Another candidate might be Robert Hooke. While Hooke was certainly a difficult man to like or even at times tolerate, that doesn't diminish the extraordinary breadth of his investigations. The knock against Hooke would be that he was more of a technician than a scientist, working to create and perfect a vast array of the instruments and apparatuses found during his time, but never really following through on any projects sufficiently to really nail down a phenomenon. Hooke seems to have lacked the mathematical ability or, more importantly, inclination to attempt to express his ideas in terms of natural laws. Christian Huygens certainly presents himself as a viable choice, though there is, again, a certain deficiency in his work towards rig rigorous observation and mathematical rigor. As with Hooke, there is a great level of technical achievement, but perhaps something is still lacking. I think what can be said is that each of these men is a transitional figure. If men like Tycho, Kepler, and Galileo have one foot in the old world and another in the new, Cassini, Hooke, Huygens, and others like Wren, Flamsteed, and Hevelius are maybe three-quarters of the way there. For me, the first person I truly see as one who embraces the full Baconian scientific paradigm as the full foundation of his thinking is Edmund Halley. In Halley, it is evident that in every sense, when he took up a topic related to the natural world, he saw it as being governed completely by natural laws that were fully understandable by the human intellect, and subject to testing and evaluation, not first through human reason, but instead through the gathering of data that would guide reason in a powerful synthesis of the ideas of both Galileo and Bacon. In this episode, what I'd like to do is take a look at the wide array of his scientific endeavors up to the time of the Paramore expeditions. Not primarily to tell the story of each project in its full detail, but instead to more fully understand the habits of mind that have been growing in the Western mind and in Western thinking over the 200 years between Columbus's discovery of discovery and Newton's complete recasting of the science of mechanics. Something will take some time to evaluate more fully in a couple of episodes. As one final note before we plunge headlong into Halley's life, I should say a few things about pronunciations. First, I need to correct a rather terrible mistake from last week. On several occasions in that episode, I mispronounced the name of that friend of Newton's who sought his advice on gambling as Samuel Pepys. It has been pointed out to me, it should be said peeps, and I apologize for not getting that right at all, even a little bit. As always, please pardon my reader's affliction of trying to sound out words phonetically when I'm not familiar with them. The second thing I should mention has to do with Halley's name, both first and last. In the sources I've seen for his first name, Edmund, it can be spelled either with an O or a U, which slightly changes how it is spoken. As I learned it using the latter pronunciation and latter spelling, that's what I'll go with it through this episode, as anything else will probably sound really unnatural. 
The other more commonly discussed pronunciation has to do with his last name. It is not, as was commonly done during my youth, said as Haley. Bill Haley was an early rock and roll musician, and so in the U.S., his last name was conflated with the historical figure's last name, and at least a generation of American schoolchildren grew up learning Halley's name incorrectly. The two ways that I've seen it said, or at least purported to be said, are either, as I've said it, Halley, or the other would be Holly, with the former being more prevalent. As you've no doubt already gathered, I'm going to go with that. If there are any of you out there who are militant about this and who hold to different traditions, I hope you will forgive me if I don't follow your preference. So let's talk about Halley's early life, such as we know about it. While it seems that he was born in London, the records of the year and date of his birth were destroyed in the Great Fire of 1666 that claimed many of the churches of the city. From what I've been able to find, Halley himself claimed that he was born on the 29th of October, 1656, but this date would have meant that his parents would have only been married some seven weeks at the date of his birth, leading some to suggest that he was born actually a year later. In either case, he was born in the London community of Hagerston to a well-to-do businessman who made a tidy profit from salting meat and turning fat trimmings cut from that meat into soap for the British Navy. Halley's father also owned a number of properties in London, many of which were destroyed by the fire. Nevertheless, Edmund grew up in a comfortable life, and when he went off to Latin school after the years of his early school, it would be at St. Paul's which, though its cathedral building had been destroyed a few years earlier, still gathered together the children of some of the wealthiest of the non-noble families of the city. By all accounts, Halley was very successful at the school and well-liked, a pattern that would occur throughout his life. He would become the school's captain, something of a class president, while also living at the periphery of the nautical world his father did business in. It is likely that while growing up he would have spent some time on the docks and wharves of London, especially in the naval yards there. It is here that he would have first experienced the nautical culture that he would so readily take to later in life. In fact, his first scientific observations would be made using the most important of navigational instruments, the magnetic compass. At some point, the father had occasion to acquire for his bright and inquisitive son a reasonably good compass, and the boy began making measurements of what is known as magnetic variation. Simply stated, magnetic variation is the difference between where the north end of the compass needle points and the direction of the north star in the night sky. While it may surprise you to learn that the geographic and magnetic poles of the earth are not at exactly the same place, this was something that had been known to sailors for some time in Halley's day. We'll talk about the history of the compass when we get to our series on the history of geography and geodesy, but its development and use in navigation was something in Europe that had greatly benefited from the cultural contacts of the Chinese Empire, where the technology seems to date back to somewhere around 250 BCE, and it was used in navigation as early as the 14th century. While early compasses had been very crude, amounting to little more than a weakly magnetized steel or iron wire centered on a pivot, by Halley's time the technology had been refined to enough of a degree that it was possible to distinguish not only variation, but also what is known as the magnetic dip angle, or the angle a compass needle declined with respect to the horizontal. These two measurements would capture the young Halley's mind in a number of ways, and their acknowledgement and sort of recording would make up a great part of his life's scientific work. However, in his youth, he would make variation measurements both from the family townhouse in Hagerston, at the St. Paul's Temporary School facility, and at the family townhouse outside the city. As we've said, to be able to make a measurement of the magnetic variation, one has to not only take a compass reading, but there also has to be a measurement of what can be thought of as true, true geographic north. While this position is nearly marked with what we call Polaris or the North Star, that star isn't exactly due north. While the difference isn't much, especially to the casual observer, it is enough that a small correction has to be made for the more careful observer. This correction can be arrived at in a few different ways, but whichever method one uses, there is a need to know quite a little bit about the sky. This need to know some astronomy caught Halley's attention, 
as it has so many other young minds. And he would later say that astronomy was his first love as a result. This interest in and practice of structured observation would serve him well when he enrolled as an undergraduate at Oxford and Queens College. He was enrolled as a commoner, meaning his tuition was paid for by his father than, rather than by the church or some state official, as would have been the case for an aspiring member of the clergy or a son of a noble family. Very soon, though, he showed himself a cut above most of his classmates by not only learning the mathematics and astronomy required of him in his classes, but by extending those to application in a real problem. In 1675, less than two years after his enrollment, Halley published a paper giving an improved method of establishing the elliptical orbits of the various planets. And I want to note here, this is an improvement on the work of Kepler himself not the usual work of an undergraduate. And so the article brought him to the attention of the various professional astronomers of England, including both Christopher Wren and John Flamsteed. As we've mentioned in our earlier episodes, Flamsteed had been named the Astronomer Royale earlier that year and had begun taking various measurements at the site in Greenwich in order to assist mariners in their various navigational tasks. Flamsteed was in need of an assistant to help him take the data he was beginning to accumulate and turn it into coordinates on, on the celestial sphere, something that required a strong knowledge of a subfield of mathematics known as spherical trigonometry. In addition to this work, Halley and Flamsteed collaborated on making observations of various astronomical events from the two locations of Greenwich and Oxford, and that allowed them to better establish the timing of those events and thus to determine the difference in both latitude and longitude of both locations. With the establishment of the Royal Observatory, the practice of measuring longitude with respect to the observatory's location, which would become known first in England and then eventually around the world as the prime meridian would become common. While Flamsteed and Halley worked well together on a professional level, at least initially, the two men were very different personally. As we've said, Flamsteed was a somewhat taciturn and humorless man who took very seriously the Puritan values he had been raised with during the time of the Protectorate. Halley, on the other hand, had no memory of the years of very strict and somber living under Cromwell and his followers, and so was more significantly shaped by the urban life of London under the restored Charles II. Halley was more easygoing, friendly, and less outwardly pious than Flamsteed. Flamsteed, growing up, out, growing up without the wealth Halley was accustomed to, had had to make his own way in the world, overcoming a bout of serious illness to do so. This difference in upbringing would contribute to a vastly different worldview between the two men, something that would eventually drive a deep wedge between them. During this time, however, with the role of the two well-established and understood, Flamsteed, the established and respected astronomer, and Halley, the gifted but inexperienced prodigy, there was nothing but praise for Halley's talent and industry. Flamsteed referred to him as, quote, the ingenious youth, and others described him as, quote, an industrious bee who always spoke with an uncommon degree of sprightliness and vivacity, end quote. Halley was tall, handsome, optimistic, and adventurous, and he was making a name for himself as a young man of extraordinary talent. He seemed to embody the spirit of a new age of science and industry that places like London were assuming a place of leadership over the more established capitals of Venice, Genoa, and Paris. His next step would vault him from interesting youth to major player on that emerging stage. Rising some 800 meters out of the Atlantic Ocean, St. Helena would have been the last place one would have expected to have found a young English gentleman in 1676. But in November of that year, Halley, along with a friend and observational assistant by the name of Clark, stepped off of the East India Company's merchant vessel Unity to undertake a scientific endeavor that might make their names if they were lucky or good or both. The island lies on the mid-Atlantic ridge that runs between Africa and South America, and at the time it represented Britain's southernmost possession, 
operated by the corporation originally chartered by Elizabeth I, and granted a right to take possession of the tiny speck of terra firma by Oliver Cromwell in 1657. Measuring some 50 square miles, or about 130 square kilometers, the island lies 2,000 kilometers west of Angola and 4,000 kilometers east of Rio de Janeiro, making it one of the most isolated places on the planet. Discovered first by a Portuguese explorer, it had changed hands several times by the time Halley arrived, most recently just three years earlier in 1673, when mercenaries of the company forced to take over from their Dutch counterparts. The importance of the island was that for 150 years, it had operated as a stopover point for ocean-going vessels crossing the South Atlantic Ocean. Halley had arrived after surveying the astronomical landscape of both England and Europe and recognizing that there wasn't much space for an ambitious young investigator to make a name for himself. Across Europe, there were now three great observers, Cassini in Paris, Flamsteed in London, and Hevelius in Danzig, each with equipment, facilities, and support that Halley would be hard pressed to match. Moreover, in London, men like Wren and Hooke towered over the discourse meaning that if one were to make a place for himself in the circles of experimental philosophy, he would have to do something that would bring him to their notice, which was not an easy task. How exactly Halley landed on his idea is unknown, but it may well have arisen after a conversation with his father, or one of his father's associates, about the recent recapture and use of the island by ships sailing under the auspices of the British East India Company. While sailors had access to reasonably good charts of the stars visible in the northern hemisphere, navigating in the southern half of the globe was much more difficult due to the lack of good charts for those parts of the sky. Indeed, for much of the trade to and from India and surrounding regions, vessels had tended to use the old methods of staying close to the shoreline. However, as more vessels began crossing the open waters of the southern hemisphere, the need for better navigational aids became critical. In late 1675, as Halley was working for Flamsteed, he proposed an expedition to St. Helena to make the needed observation to cre create good southern hemisphere star charts. King Charles II, when presented with the proposal and the enthusiastic support of his astronomer Royal, approved the project and offered to provide transportation and lodging. For the rest of the expenses, Halley's father stepped up to make it possible for his son to take what has to be one of the most intriguing study abroad trips ever attempted. Halley thus traveled in relative luxury, and that would offend Flamsteed's Puritan sensibilities, and that would also act as the initial irritant in their relationship. For celestial observation, Halley had taken both a large sextant with telescopic sights as well as a new invention from the Huygens brothers, something known as, known as an aerial telescope, that consisted of only an objective lens and a housing that could be mounted in a tree or at some other high point, and then an eyepiece assembly. The two pieces were then aligned using a taut string. This design allowed for the long focal length telescopes that Huygens had created to be transported without having to deal with an unwieldy long tube. As would usually be the case, Halley and Clark also carried with them compasses to make measurements of the magnetic phenomenon of the island. Halley had selected St. Helena in part based on the accounts of sailors who spoke of the pure and clear skies found there nearly, nearly year-round. Unfortunately, however, the ring of mountains that make up the island gives rise to a meteorological phenomenon where clouds often form at the higher elevations of the peaks, thus shrouding any views of the sky. While Halley had expected to be able to make observations over a fairly short period of time, it turned out that it would be over a year before he and Clark would get all of the things that they needed to create a reasonably accurate set of charts. One silver lining to this was that the two men were able to observe a transit of the planet Mercury across the face of the Sun. In this, Halley found that he was able to time the start and end of the transit, which is that time it took for the black circle of the disk of Mercury to first touch the disk of the Sun until it last disappeared from view, to within about one second of precision over the course of the five-hour event. As a side note, this sort of transit is similar to what was observed by the TRAPPIST telescope 
Spitzer Space Telescope, and now most recently by the Kepler Space Probe, except that while Halley could actually observe the disk of Mercury crossing the much larger luminous disk of the Sun, the modern instruments measured a decrease in the amount of light received from the distance low, distant low mass dwarf star. As he was working up his data, Halley realized that due to the curvature of a spherical Earth, an observer at a higher latitude would measure a slightly different transit time due to being just a bit further away from the Sun and Mercury. What he then realized with the, was that this difference, with some creative mathematics, could be used to determine the distance of the Earth from the Sun. The Italian astronomer in Paris, Cassini, had used similar reasoning with an observation of the position of Mars to estimate that the distance between the Earth and the Sun was some 80 to 90 million miles. But Cassini also felt like there were so many errors in his measurement that that number was fairly unreliable. What Halley hoped was that when he returned to London and compared his measurements to those taken there at the Royal Observatory, he would be able to create a similar sort of calculation and thus get a better or more accurate determination of the distance of the Earth to the Sun. However, when Halley returned to London in early 1678, he found that the measurements made there were not sufficiently precise to do the calculations with enough accuracy to give a reliable estimate. However, what he did realize is that the transit of Venus could be treated in the same way, but as the time for the transit would take longer, the relative uncertainty would be smaller and thus the calculation could be more accurate. Unfortunately, transits of Venus only happen about twice a century, and the next one wouldn't occur until 1761, with a second one taking place in 1769. By the time of the first, Halley would be 19 years in the grave. Nevertheless, as we've said, he would promote the idea of this his entire life. Unfortunately, the 1761 transit took place at the height of the Seven Years' War, but the second was observed in a number of locations, including at Tahiti. While the presence of Venus's atmosphere, more or less unknown at the time, complicated things, the measurements, as we said, were able to create a m much more reliable and confident number by the way, interestingly enough, that number was the number I was taught when I was in elementary school, and it wouldn't be superseded until observations from the Arecibo Radio Telescope some years later. When, in 1678, Halley returned to London and published his results, they generated a sensation among both the scholarly and maritime communities of England. The charts were a huge boon for sailors and contributed to the expansion of scientific knowledge in both the charts themselves and in the use of the aerial telescope. As a reward for his work, Oxford granted Halley not only his bachelor's degree at the age of 22, but also his Master of Arts. He was no longer merely Flamsteed's talented assistant, but an experimental philosopher, astronomer, and mathematician in his own right. Less than a year later, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society. Halley's next mission would again take him across the water, though this time only for a short voyage across the North and Baltic Seas, rather than a three-month voyage over the open waters of the Atlantic expanse. When his star chart was published, Halley had sent a copy to the Polish astronomer Johannes Hevelius, with a note to the effect that he would enjoy getting to meet with the 68-year-old astronomical legend and learning about his observational methods. Hevelius had been one of Europe's leading astronomers for almost 30 years since the building of his first observatory in 1641, the year before Isaac Newton's birth and 15 years before Halley's. While delighted to receive both Halley's charts and his request to visit, the old man likely knew that there was more to what was going on here than Halley was letting on. Hevelius was, as they say, old school in his methodology. He still used instruments with naked eye or open sights rather than telescopic ones to make measurements of the positions of the stars, planets, and occasional transitory phenomena such as comets. The thinking in England, especially from Hook, who questioned everything everyone else did, and Flamsteed, who took enormous pride in the instruments he had procured in Greenwich, 
was that Hevelius's data was inferior and unreliable compared to that of the Royal Observatory. Neither man could believe that someone using unmagnified sighting could arrive at the same precision as those who did. Halley had been asked by the Royal Society to travel to Danzig, participate in some of the observing sessions, and report back with the expectation that he would confirm the suspicions of the astronomers of the Royal Society. The visit could have gone rather disastrously and might have even created a bit of an international kerfuffle, but England's scientific society had chosen its emissary wisely, as Halley's charming nature and willingness to consider any man's ideas immediately diffused any tension, and Havelius was eager to show someone truly willing to give his methods a chance on how well they worked. So, the secret to Havelius's success was that he was absolutely meticulous, not only in his instrument construction, but also in his observational methodology. Assisted by his second wife, an excellent observer in, his own, in her own right, Havelius was able to demonstrate to Halley that over and over he could produce measurements that were as good, if not better, than those of either Cassini or Flamsteed. While he might have benefited from extraordinarily good eyesight, even at such an advanced age, what is much more likely to have been the key factor in arriving at his precision was that he had been practicing making observations with amazingly constructed sights for years and years and years, and thus had honed his ability through hard work and lots of practice. While telescopic sights would one day provide more accuracy than open sights, the flaws in their construction and a lack of good observing practice at that time meant that they were really not yet superior. As is often the case with advanced technology, what telescopic sights allowed for was that men with less experience and skill than Hevelius could make observations with a precision approaching his literally thousands of nights in the observing chair. Hevelius and Halley got along famously, with Halley enjoying the city of Danzig in the company of Hevelius and his wife. And near the end of the month-long visit, he wrote, at the older astronomer's request, a very laudatory report about his work. Halley's insistent that, insistence that Hevelius' methods produced results superior to those of Flamsteed's rubbed the prickly astronomer Royale the wrong way. From this point forward, it seems that ha Flamsteed more or less turned against his one-time assistant and began to actively work against his plans wherever he could. When Halley returned to England, he didn't stay long, as he was once again sent as a representative to another observatory, this time Cassini's outside of Paris. Folded into the great tradition of the European Grand Tour, Halley observed the comet of 1680 with Cassini, and the two men likely spent the evenings at the observatory discussing the various ideas about the paths of comets in the solar system, as well as the possibility of their reoccurrence, something Cassini was a strong proponent of. This would be Halley's first in-depth exposure to the subject he would become so strongly associated with. Halley would return to England after several months in Rome at the beginning of 1682, and soon he fell in love with the young Mary Took. The two were married in April and would remain together for the next 60 years, even though Halley's many absences in the name of scientific investigation and discovery often kept them apart. The two lived at first in Islington, and then in the center of London, as that part of the city was rebuilt after the fire. While we don't know a great deal about their life together, we know that three of their children survived into adulthood, two daughters and a son. We do also know that for the next several years, Halley seems to have settled down to pursue projects closer to home, including making a number of lunar observations. It was during this period that Halley fell in with Hook and Wren as part of Hook's regular coffeehouse gathering. The younger man had certainly proved his worth as an experimental philosopher, and the three men had similar interests and investigations. During this time, Halley seems to have arrived at the mathematical solution that if one were to assume that there was an attractive force between the sun and the planets that grew weaker as the inverse square of the distance between the two, one could derive from that relationship Kepler's third law of planetary motion, the relationship that related the time it took for a planet to complete one orbit around the sun to the mean distance of the planet from the sun. In mathematical terms, this relationship goes as the period squared is proportional to the radius of the orbit cubed. 
When he brought this to the attention of Hook and Wren, they indicated that they too had found the relationship. The discussion soon turned to the more difficult question of whether or not one could derive the shape of the orbit from an inverse square law. Wren conceded that he had tried, but had been unsuccessful. Hook, in that customary fashion, bragged that he had a solution, but that he would withhold it until enough other men had tried and failed so that they could better appreciate his unique kind of genius. Seeing this as Hook's usual blowing smoke, Wren offered a sort of a, a put-up-or-shut-up kind of prize. In my research for the Newton biographies, the sources usually said that the reward for producing a solution was a monetary prize of about 40 shillings. But as I've dug into the various accounts of Halley's life, the story changes a bit, with Wren offering an expensive book worth about that same amount. My guess is that from some of the primary sources, diaries, letters, and such, the way they record it is a little different than the way Halley records it in his diary. This is hardly surprising, as Halley would have had little need for a cash prize and would have found the book a much more suitable inducement. As we've already mentioned in previous episodes, Halley was no more successful than any of the others, but some of this may be attributable to a personal tragedy that struck in early 1684. Early one morning, Halley's father had left his home in order to conduct his usual business for the day. He did not return that evening or ever again, his body being found weeks later, having washed up on the shore of a river 25 miles east of London. It was only identifiable by the shoes worn by the corpse. This personal tragedy, likely the result of foul play, was compounded by the fact that Halley's father had remarried after the death of Halley's mother, and the son and second wife did not get along well. The two would eventually end up in court over the inheritance. To this was added the responsibility of settling his father's accounts with various vendors and clients, as well as collecting rents from property tenants. This lengthy process, while not necessarily difficult, likely kept him tied to London for the next several years. Once the immediate grief and dealings of this whole matter were taken care of, Halley turned once again to the problem of planetary motion. Still unable to solve the conundrum, he decided to pay a visit to Isaac Newton. And that's something that we've described in some detail in an earlier episode, and so we'll more or less skip it here. The result of this, of course, was the nine-page paper on the motion of planetary objects and then, with Halley's urging, the full Principia, a publication that Halley oversaw until completion and also financed. It was a work that one could say might have never seen the light of day had it not been for Halley's good-natured and sensitive handling of the touchy Newton. To be honest, it is hard to imagine that anyone else could have induced the Cambridge mathematician to reveal his work to the broader world given Newton's difficult relations with others and his exceedingly solitary nature. However, just as was the case with Redicus when seeing Copernicus's work through the publication process, Halley was involved with work of his own, work that was of some vital importance to the men his father had worked with and kept supplied for many years. On his trip to St. Helena, Halley had not only taken astronomical readings, but also a number of meteorological ones. While he was, by inclination, an astronomer first in his experimental philosophy, he was a nautical man second. Throughout his life, we will see him return to the sea and investigations surrounding it over and over again. In 1686, as he was going over the proofs of the first book of the Principia with Newton, Halley published a paper in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society detailing the atmospheric observations he had taken on his trip to the Lonely Island in the South Atlantic. The primary topic of the paper was a description of the trade winds and monsoons of the region, but as a tool to help his re readers visualize the data, he produced some of the first maps of the atmosphere. Some of the symbols used on these maps to indicate what are known as trailing winds are still used by meteorologists today. In addition, he was able to establish the relationship between solar heating and atmospheric motion by identifying the role of the thermal circulation cell, and he showed that the relationship between barometric pressure and height that had been found in France and England applied to the small island in the southern hemisphere as well. During this period, Halley had been appointed as the clerk of the Royal Society, 
a position wherein he assisted the various elected secretaries with the correspondence that came and went. In this role, he would have seen the mountains of data that were beginning to pour into the organization. These reports inspired his thinking on a host of topics and would contribute to the breadth of his researches. While many of his ideas were groundbreaking in their insight and scope, they weren't always well received by an establishment still coming to terms with the newly scientific ethos of the age or the men who most completely embraced it. As we have noted previously, one of Halley's enduring curiosities was the investigation of the Earth's magnetic field. That there was a difference between the position of the geographic and magnetic poles of the Earth begged for an explanation, and Halley would spend much of his life giving that particular puzzle a good deal of thought. The phenomenon had been known since at least the time of William Gilbert, who had, in his monumental work on magnetism published in 1600, suggested the cause of the magnetic deviation was due to the greater magnetism of various land masses as compared to that of the oceans. It had been Gilbert who had shown that the magnetic field of the Earth was similar to that of a bar magnet, with both a north and south magnetic pole, with each located near the, or at the geographic poles. Though, as many people are surprised to learn, it is the south magnetic pole that is at the north geographic pole and vice versa. This is why the north end of a compass needle points in the way that it does as it is attracted to that south magnetic pole. By Halley's day, however, Gilbert's hypothesis regarding the magnetic variation had been shown to be wrong. As more and more direct readings of the Earth's magnetic fields were taken by ships, captains, and navigators, it became clear that sometimes the variation pointed away from the land, while at other times it pointed towards it. Robert Hooke had suggested that a better explanation would be to recognize that if one modeled the source of the Earth's magnetic field as a lodestone or a bar magnet, it would be best to think of the source as being tilted somewhat to, with the Earth's rotational axis. This source, Hooke said, might then be thought to turn with respect to that rotational axis, causing the poles to drift somewhat over time. Halley, however, had more data available to him than Hooke did. He had observations from two different hemispheres, and so he proposed a more complicated model that used what is now called a quadrupole field, or a magnetic influence with not just two poles, but four. He had Hooke's two poles as the strongest, as in roughly more or less the same locations as Hooke had had them, but he also had another two, offset from those, that moved or rotated with respect to the Earth's axis, thus accounting for the drift in the magnetic field readings. To account for this new model, Halley had also created a new hypothesis for the interior structure of the Earth. Until Halley, the assumption was that the Earth was a simple sphere made up of more or less homogeneous mixtures of things. Stuff like what you would find in the crust. Basically, think of a great big solid ball made up of the stuff, the dirt, the rocks, the Earth that the surface of the Earth is made up of. Halley instead proposed a new picture that said that the Earth was composed of a solid sphere surrounded by a shell with an empty space in between the two. He said that the two solid bits, that inner sphere and the outer shell, each had their own magnetism with their own poles, and that they rotated at slightly different rates. This, he said, accounted for his four-pole model that he had proposed, along with the drift of the two weaker poles that were generated by the inner sphere. Looking back now, with our modern perspective, Halley's idea seems a bit far-fetched, or maybe, you know, the product of some sort of Jules Verne science fiction tale. But let's give the guy a little bit of credit. Halley's got a set of observations that don't work with the simple models that have been proposed. He looks at the assumptions that have been made, and he decides to think about what would happen if he threw one of those assumptions out. What he arrived at, while certainly in the realm of speculation, wasn't completely, therefore, out of left field. While it had a number of issues, the model did explain the observations to a better degree than had been talked about up to that point. 
What is interesting, of course, is that Halley's rejection of a solid Earth model turns out to have been correct as the measurements of the travel of earthquake waves through the Earth have shown that the Earth does indeed have a fairly complex interior structure, with a solid inner core that is somewhat isolated from the mantle and crust by a fluid outer core layer. Geologists have shown over the last couple of decades that this inner core does in fact rotate at a different rate than the mantle and crust do. Now, before we go and say that Halley was a man centuries ahead of his time, it should be noted that there are major differences between what he proposed and what has turned out to be true as measured by modern geologists. What's really important to recognize here is Halley's willingness to entertain new, data-driven ideas to solve older problems, one of the hallmarks of truly good scientific thinking. Another case of this sort of thing is something that got him into a lot of trouble with all the wrong people. While Halley was a religious man, it is clear that he believed that God chose to work in his creation through the action of natural physical laws rather than by direct application of his will in every case. A great example of this was he thought that objects fell because of the gravitational attraction to the earth rather than due to an exercise of the will of the creator in each case. While God may have decreed the universal law of gravitation and how it would act on objects possessing mass, once this law was in place, it governed the fall of objects without the direct intervention of the Almighty. Only miraculous suspensions of this law required his intervention. This belief ran Halley's views on religion too close to those of the deists for some observers, and thus he was accused at times of being everything from merely an irreligious man to a full-on atheist. What seems to be clear is that like many of those who were well off in London, including the king himself, Halley was a faithful Christian whose beliefs formed an important part of his worldview, but only a part of his worldview. As such, he wasn't nearly devout enough for those like Flamsteed who were much more pious in their view of religion. Two specific places where this seems to have gotten Halley into some hot water had to do with the saltiness of the oceans and the biblical account of the flood. In the first case, Halley had been experimenting with evaporation and had seen that when seawater evaporated, it left behind the salts that had been dissolved in the water. Halley correctly reasoned that if the oceans had started off as pure water, evaporation would have carried away the water that then would have been replenished by the rivers and streams that emptied back into the oceans. In an early case of understanding the water cycle, Halley understood that these two processes had to be balanced in a sort of equilibrium, otherwise the ocean levels would have risen or fallen over time. If this were the case, then, the returning river water would contain a small amount of dissolved material, such as salt and various minerals. When the evaporation then took place, the salt would be left behind in the ocean, causing the salinity of a body of water to rise ever so slightly. Halley decided to calculate how long it would take for the oceans to reach their present level of saltiness, and came up with an answer of it taking on the order of a couple of million years. While this is, in fact, not a bad estimate of the time it would take for those processes to produce what we see, Halley couldn't believe that the Earth was that old. The other matter was how to account for the biblical description of the flood. Halley understood that the Jewish texts were sparse in their detail of describing the events, and thus couldn't be relied on solely to come up with the physical explanations of such events as they were recorded. As such, he and others tried to fill in the blanks where they could. In this instance, Halley understood that it would be difficult to imagine a rate of rainfall that would cover the earth in just 40 days. Even if rain fell constantly at a rate of about, of about maybe 2 inches an hour, something nearing the maximum of what had ever been observed in England, and then did so for a full 40 days, the resulting rise in oceanic water levels would only amount to about 130 feet. While this is certainly substantial, it was not enough to cover all of the known land. Now, at this point, Halley admitted that the Almighty could do whatever he wished, and so could have just willed the water into and then out of, exi out of existence. 
but he preferred to provide an explanation based on physical laws and events. One of the ideas he gave thought to again came from Robert Hooke. Hooke had suggested that the Earth's rotational axis had changed over time, something that had happened rather slowly. As Newton had shown, the rotation of the Earth caused the Earth to bulge a bit around the middle of its uh, rotation axis. And so changing that rotation axis would allow the water of the oceans to travel across continents, submerging things once above the water and revealing what had once been under the waves. Halley, however, pointed out that the latitudes of the various cities had not changed in thousands of years, and so such an idea was pretty unlikely to be true. In its place, he offered up the idea that the Earth had been struck by a comet and had been suddenly knocked over to a new rotational axis. The problem with this hypothesis was that it raised as many questions as it answered, and so he didn't really carry the analysis beyond the original stages. What is important to understand is that here again we see his belief that the flood story is an historical event that needed to be explained, rather than a fictional thing that could be dismissed as mythology or something like that. Where this all hurt him was in the reality that there were many within the Church of England who did not like the idea of subjugating theological description to physical explanation. As such, when the civilian professor of astronomy opened up at Oxford, Halley was turned down for the post. Even though he was clearly the most qualified candidate for the professorship, something attested to by the recommendations made by both the Royal Society and the University of Oxford itself, the hierarchy of the church, most notably the Bishop of Oxford, stood against him. Additionally, many historians of the period find evidence that Flamsteed, now bitterly resenting the success and acclaim of his one-time protege, had worked to sabotage the appointment making spurious claims regarding Halley's commitment to the Christian faith and his moral character. As we mentioned in the series of episodes on the life of Newton, the position would go to the Scottish mathematician David Gregory. While all of this was taking place in 1691, Halley was engaged in another project. At the small port of Pagham, near Portsmouth, Halley had embarked on a project of creating a diving bell something he succeeded brilliantly in doing. His chamber was large enough for four or five men to sit under while it was lowered into the water. By feeding fresh air to the bell through barrels that could be lowered to it, the chamber could be kept supplied for long periods of time with breathable, breathable atmosphere, while the old air could be bled out through a valve in the top of the bell near a window crafted to be watertight and yet still let in light. In addition to this, Halley designed and built a diver's helmet and rudimentary wetsuit that would allow for someone to venture out of the bell for a limited amount of time to explore the ocean floor. The chamber was tested to a depth of 60 feet and was intended to be used not so much for scientific exploration as it was for salvage operations in the shallow waters of England's rivers and along its coasts. While he seems to have formed a company to pursue the commercial opportunities the diving bell suggested, there is no record of there ever having been a salvage operation performed. While losing out on the position of professor, combined with the later censure he was to receive from the Royal Society over his cometary impact hypothesis, might have discouraged Halley or even derailed his additional work in the sciences, such was not to be the case. After a brief stint in service of Newton's initiatives with the Mint, Halley undertook his most bold and audacious project. This story of adventure on the high seas, as well as the work on cometary orbits Halley would later do, however, we'll have to wait until next week. So as we wrap up for this episode, let me take care of a few administrative bits. First, thanks to everyone who has taken a moment to review the show over the last couple of weeks. Your kind words are greatly appreciated. Second, we are doing some work on the show's branding and crew member Jessica Grania has put together a few proof of concept graphics designs for us. 
I've posted these out to the Facebook page and I'd really like to get your feedback on what you like. If you have a few minutes, head on over there and either click on the like button for the graphics you prefer or leave a comment or two. We could really use the feedback as we head into the next phase of refining those designs. Third, if you have some feedback on the audio quality of the show, drop me a note at cldavies at mac.com. Fourth, the hosting service we use here at the Scientific Odyssey, Libsyn, has asked us to try to join their tripod initiative that they're promoting. In this, they're hoping that listeners of the various shows they host will try and share a single episode of a podcast they enjoy with one other person they know. I think it's a great idea, and that it would be great if you all wouldn't mind telling a friend about our show and maybe sending them a link to one of the episodes via email or text or however you like to communicate. Maybe the show on Rounding the Earth would be good, or our recent discovery of the Trappist-1 discoveries. If you think they might be into scientific biography, why not share this episode with them? Whatever you think to do would be really appreciated. Over the last few months, the size of our crew has now grown to some eight or 900 members, and so that's really great, but I know that there's room for a lot more. Finally, thanks to whoever it was who shared the show to the StumbleUpon platform. We're beginning to see a lot of traffic from that site, which is really exciting, and our download numbers continue to grow. So, you guys are a great crew, and I really appreciate all the stuff that you do that helps get the podcast out there. Next week, we'll sail alongside the crew of the Paramore as she makes her way to the Southern Seas with Halley in command. Until then, full sails on your journey.